Uh, before we jump into it, archaeologically speaking, I just want to, I think we have some pictures there, Kylie. Yeah, perfect. So this is a real event that took place in a real, uh, in a real location. So this is a modern day picture of uh, Nablus. It's in the West Bank. It's 63 kilometers north of Jerusalem. It's the biblical city of Shechem or Sychar. Sychar is where we're going to read where this um, event takes place. Uh, today it's a big city, um, but at the time it was a smaller one. And then you can see a mountain in the background, and the city's kind of built around that. That's Mount Zim. And so this is where the Samaritans worshipped. And so this is the location of the ancient Samaritans, and they had their temple built up on Mount Gerizim. You can go there today and still see the ruins of, of, uh, of the Samaritan temple. Okay, I'll flip it over. So we're going to read it in a second, but Jesus goes to a well called, ja- called Jacob's Well, and he meets a woman who's a Samaritan woman. This well still exists today. Um, you can actually go there and see it. It's Jacob's well, and as, as they do in that part of the world, they build a church over these famous sites. So we'll flip over there, Kylie, please. Thank you. This is the inside of the church. Pretty typical church there, but you can actually go inside the grotto there. There's, you can kind of see a door. And to the, the picture to my left here, or my right, is the actual well. And so that's Jacob's well. It still exists, and no one really argues that this is the biblical well. It's, it's, it's uh, pretty much considered one of the most... Um, uh, how do we put it? One of the most authentic holy sites in Jerusalem because you can't move a well, right? So it's there. And so you can actually go there, dump a bucket down there, and still pick up water. And so it's still flowing with water. So this is where the event takes place. I show you this to say this isn't a, this is a place, this is a story that, that happened in a real location. And we believe it's a real event because John records it as a real event, a real conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. So let's read it. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Jesus learned that the Pharisees... to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to the water, will you give me a drink? The disciples had gone into town to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritan. So we'll stop there, and uh, I want to show this map here. Uh, this is a profound story in that Jesus breaks down so many barriers, so many boundaries that exist in that context in order to have this conversation with the woman. I'm going to walk us through what some of these barriers are. The first one is racial barrier. Okay, so same as all, there was a deeply racist culture. Uh, the Samaritans and the Jews were bitter rivals. They were bitter enemies, and they did not like each other at all. So Jesus was in Judea, see at the bottom there, and in the middle of Samaria, and then up Galilee. And so the Jews lived in Judea and Galilee, and so when they traveled between Judea and Galilee, they would take an extra couple days and actually avoid Samaria. They'd go through Perea and the Decapolis, Galilee, and vice versa because they did not want to step foot in Samaria because they hated those people so bad they did not want to talk to them or see them, they would avoid them. And so the first barrier that Jesus crosses is that he doesn't go around like every other Jew would have straight through Samaria. He says, I don't care about this boundary. I'm going straight through Samaria. I'm going to take the quick route. Why were the Samaritans hated so bad? This is a long and complicated history, and I'm going to give you a real nutshell history of it. Uh, you know your Old Testament where you have Israel and they are one nation and then they eventually become two nations. You got the north and the south. You have Judea and northern Israel and they're kind of doing their own thing. The Assyrians come in and they take over northern Israel and they take uh, some of the people out and they bring some of their own people in. And so you have this mixing of northern Israelites and Assyrians. And it's a real mixing of cultures and language and ethnicity. And this is happening while Judea, the south, is, is staying um, uh, purely Jewish. And so the Jews hated what was happening in Samaria because they considered them uh, a mixed race. 
they were mixing their religions, they were mixing their language, they were mixing their customs, and they just basically watered down what it meant to be Jewish. When, Jews, when the Greeks came in and conquered this land, the Greeks actually set up their political um, administration in Samaria. And so the Samaritans essentially were, essentially were controlling the Jewish people. And the Jewish people hated this. So again, it was another reason why the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews retaliated against the Samaritans. They went up to Mount Gerizim and destroyed their temple. And then the Samaritans, they retaliated, came back and dumped a bunch of bones on the on the Jewish, te- on the Jerusalem temple. So there was just all this back and forth rivalry, and they just absolutely hated each other. The Jews called the Samaritans half-breeds, enemies, and dogs. It was like they just, the hatred that they had to talk about deep-seated racism so I would go around and not through Samaria. But Jesus doesn't care. What's he do? He walks straight through Samaria so he can have this conversation with who? A Samaritan. He shouldn't be doing that. Barrier. Religious barriers. So we've talked about it. The Samaritans had a mixed religion. It's called syncretism where you're mixing uh, religious ideologies. And so the Samaritans kept a little bit of their Jewish heritage, but they mixed it with pagan religions. And for the Jews, they were just like, how can you do this? You have watered down the faith. You are syncretistic. It looks sort of Jewish, but it's still very pagan. The Samaritans rejected the Jerusalem temple. Said, we will not worship there. God does not exist there. We're going to build our own temple, Mount Gerizim. The Jews said, oh, that's just, you guys are defiling. You, you guys are wrong, and you are defiling where you think God lives. And so there's just barriers. Jewish rabbis would avoid Jewish rabbis like Jesus would avoid the Samaritans because they would be considered unclean. Just even being in their presence would defile you religiously. Does Jesus care? Not at all. He's in Samaria, and he's having a conversation with the Samaritan. He breaks down the barriers, and he's willing to do this. Third barrier, gender barrier. It's a woman. In that culture, a man should not be talking to a woman. That is culturally inappropriate. Uh, I'm going to read this horrible quote from the Mishnah. The Mishnah is like a Jewish uh, teaching. This is what they say. He that talks much with a woman brings evil on himself and neglects the study of the law and at last will inherit Gehenna. Wow, Gehenna's hell. So if you talk too much to a woman, you can't study the law, you're going to go to hell. Now, that's extreme, but I'm just giving you an example of how it was understood. Like, you women belong to their men and have to stick with their men and men should not talking with women. That's just the way it was done culturally back then. So what Jesus should have done, he was at the well, he saw a woman approaching, he should get up, he should back away 20 feet, turn his back, let her do her thing, and then let her on her way. What does Jesus do? He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't care about any of that. Social racism, gender boundaries, uh, geographical boundaries, he doesn't care. He has a conversation with the woman. He says, will you give me a drink? And she's absolutely stunned. How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Last thing I want to say, there's a social barrier. Uh, She is a marginalized person, even in her own culture. Here's how we know this. And you notice in the text it said it was about noon. That's very specific. It's specific because the author's trying to tell you something. It's hot culture. Uh, The women would always go together in packs to get uh, to get water together. They would do it in the morning and they would do it as a community. This woman was not part of the community. She had to go in the heat of the day by herself, which means that she wasn't even part, she wasn't even socially accepted within her own community. So she's got everything against her, right? She's a Samaritan. She's religiously a Samaritan. She's a woman. And she's an outcast in her own society. She's at the bottom rung of society. Does Jesus care? Not at all. He reaches out to the marginalized and he has this conversation with her and it blows her away. How can you ask me for water? I think this is one of the most powerful pictures of Jesus in the scriptures. It's absolutely amazing to me that he did this. He defies all cultural and social constructs that place shame on people. He breaks, all the, breaks down all of those barriers and what he, does he do? He gives dignity and he gives value to all of us and to this woman. It's one of the greatest and most powerful messages of Christianity. You have value. You have dignity. 
You are made in the image of God. It doesn't matter what your society tells, you, tells about you. It doesn't matter what your family might say about you. It doesn't matter what your family might say about you if they, these, these things aren't helpful. At the end of the day, it's irrelevant. What does God say about you? Because that's what really matters. And what does he say? He says, I don't care about any of those cultural, societal boundaries. You have worth. You have value. What I have, I want to give to you. And that's what Jesus says to this woman. It's an incredibly powerful moment in the scriptures. I traveled to India, and I've learned a little bit about the caste system there. Just, just it's, it's hard to fathom how, um, how disruptive that caste system is. So if you're born in the high caste, you got everything given to you. But if you're born in the low caste, and it's not your fault, you didn't do anything to deserve that, you have almost no opportunities given to you. And so the low castes are called the Delites, and their nickname is the Untouchables because nobody can touch them. There are villages that if a Delete person is walking down the sidewalk and their shadow falls on somebody higher caste than them, that person is defiled, and the Delete person has to have a consequence. You can't share a cup, you can't drink a water, you can't share a plate because these people are considered defiled and untouchable. It's so incredibly sad. And the church is growing in India because the church is saying, we don't believe in these social con constructs. We believe in value and dignity. And, and we believe in what Christ says about you. And so the church is filled with low caste people who finally, for the first time in their life, feel like they have a sense of self-worth when they've been told their whole life that they have none. So the church is growing. The church has a lot to say about this. Let's keep reading. Verse 10 to 14. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. What can, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, living water. Now, it's not entirely obvious to us what that actually means, right? This isn't, he's clearly not talking about physical water. He's talking about something that's a lot deeper, something that, it, this is a metaphor for something much deeper. Um, for us, it's not entirely obvious. But back then, um, everyone would have known what Jesus was connecting this to because they were steep in Old Testament culture, would have known the scriptures very well, would have known what Jesus was saying when he was offering living water. So I want to try and put ourselves into that context, into what they were thinking when they would have heard this. So we're going to look at a couple passages of scriptures that might help us understand of living water. So kind of throw them up there. First one, Psalm 42, 1 to 2. As a deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? So here's a picture of a deer, and he is the image of that's what my soul is like, and it's longing for God. I am thirsty for God. Where can I go and quench this thirst in my soul? Psalm 63, oh, you, God, are my God. I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. So again, this idea of, of this longing in your soul, this emptiness that you feel being connected with uh, thirst, being connected with water that fills up and quenches that thirst, that's what the psalmists are doing. People would have made these connections immediately when Jesus says, I'm offering living water. They would have thought of these passages, guaranteed. Next one. Come, all you who are thirsty. This is God speaking through Isaiah. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affairs. So God is saying, why are you spending your time on things that don't satisfy? If you really want to be satisfied, come to me and I will give you water. I will give you the things that you need. If you are thirsty, you can come to me. That's what's going on here. And I, I'm going to show you one more. I could spend the whole morning doing this. I'll, I'll, Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me. Again, what do you see? I see a pot that is boiling. That's the wrong passage. All right. 
we're gonna we're gonna get the, we're gonna get this one. I think it's Jeremiah two, because this is this is a gooder. Jeremiah two thirteen. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Two things you've done. You've forsaken me. God calls himself, what does he call himself? The living water. You've forsaken me, the living water. And what you've done is you've actually dug your own cistern, which means you've gone to find water, this, this thirst, this quenching for this thirsty soul. You've gone somewhere else. And you've gone to a cistern that can't even hold water. You've forsaken me, the spring of living water. So it's profound when Jesus says, I can give you living water. What he's saying is I'm the one that quenches your soul. I'm the one that satisfies you. I am the God who said, I am the living water and you have forsaken me. That's me. It's profound stuff. This incredible offer of life, of eternity, of salvation, of quenching of thirst for your soul, Jesus offers to this woman. Very powerful stuff. That's what Jesus is doing. It reminds me of John 10.10. 10. What does John say there? I have come that they might have life and life to the full. This is what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to have life in its fullness, in its abundance. He wants to satisfy our souls. He wants to give us life. It's, it's a joy-filled, purpose-driven life in its fullest sense. Being with Jesus, following Jesus, is what it means to be fully human. It's what it means to be fully alive. Sometimes we get this notion that being a Christian means you've got to act like there's a funeral going on all the time. I mean, that's not the case. Jesus came to give us life, abundant life living water, eternal kind of life. The word for life that John uses here is the word zoe in Greek. It's zoe. And we named our first daughter zoe because we're like, this is what we want for her. That she would experience this kind of life, the kind of life that God, that Jesus speaks about, the kind of life that Jesus offers to this Samaritan woman. Let's keep going. John 4, 15 to 26. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I won't get thirsty, and you have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. See that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this man. You must worship is in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, but you do not know. Truth is the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman says, I know that the Messiah, Christ, is coming. He comes, he explained everything to us. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. So, we get a picture of why this woman is an outcast, all right? Uh, it wasn't immediately obvious at the beginning, but she's a promiscuous woman. She's had five husbands, and now she's on her sixth, and she, that person's not even her husband. So, she could very well be a prostitute. At the very least, she's an adulterer, and so her own community has rejected her. She's an outcast. She's living a sinful life. Jesus calls her out, and so what is the natural thing to do when you get called out? You start talking about theology, right? So that's what, that's what the woman does. She starts talking about theology. Well, you Jews think it's about Jerusalem, but we think it's about Mount Gerizim. And she's trying to engage Jesus in this theological debate. And Jesus, he humors her for a little bit, but essentially what he says is true worship is not about a place or a location. Rather, true worship is about how you worship and who you worship in spirit and in truth. And we know that Jesus himself said, uh, I, am, I am the way, the truth, and life. So in Christ, we are worshiping in truth. And Jesus himself says, I am the one that's going to send the Spirit. And so when true worship is worship when it's rooted in Christ as the Spirit, or as the truth and through the Spirit. And then he says, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Which is a profound statement. If you know anything about the book of John, there are seven I am statements, and I am being a really significant uh, 
name for God. Do you remember when Moses encountered the burning bush and God spoke and Moses said, hey, what's your name? What does he say? What does God say? I am. So when Jesus says, I am, we know exactly what he's trying to say. I'm not just a prophet. I'm not just a human Messiah. I am God himself. I am, I am the living water himself. That's who I am. Okay. There's a little bit of an interlude because the disciples come back and they're surprised Jesus is having this conversation. We're going to skip that and we're just going to look at the Samaritan's response. So verse 39 to 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you've said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I just, I, for me, it's just such an amazing ending to the story. So the Samaritan woman has this profound encounter with Jesus, and you can kind of see how she's given value and dignity, and she's offered this incredible gift, and what does she do? What is the natural outflow of what she does? She goes back home, and she tells people, and mission flows out from her. This is John 4. So this is the beginning of the gospel. You know who the first is in the gospels? It's not the disciples. It's not Jesus sending out the 72. It's a Samaritan woman. I mean, given the context that I just laid out, that is unbelievable. It's a mission to the marginalized and the marginalized going out and doing mission. It's an incredible story of life transformation and mission flowing from what Christ has done in her life. Incredible stuff. I want to look at the progression of this, of this Samaritan woman's, um, the progression of revelation of Jesus. First of all, she identifies him as a Jewish man first. Kind of obvious, right? Secondly, she perceives that, she, that he is a prophet. Jesus clearly can know some things that most people wouldn't know about her, so she's like, okay, I guess he's a prophet. And then verse 25, she starts thinking, maybe this guy's the Messiah. He knows too much. He's saying so many good things. Maybe he's the Messiah. But the concept of the Messiah was still much less than what reality is. And then in verse 42, at the end, and this is where we all need to land. She believes him to be the savior of the world. This incredible progression from man, prophet, messiah, savior of the world. This is who Jesus is. What an incredible passage of scripture. Every time I read it, I'm blown away about what Jesus did. The obstacles he had to overcome in order to have this conversation with this woman. It's an incredible passage because we see what matters to Jesus People matter to Jesus. Individuals. He saw this woman. He saw her life. He saw her context. And he spoke to her. And then what else matters to Jesus? He wants to give us stuff. So he offers her living water. He wants to, he wants to satisfy our souls. He wants to quench our thirst for hope and meaning and purpose and longing. Our, hope, our, our longing for eternity, our longing for life here and life later. And he wants to quench that within us. This incredible gift of living Water. Worship matters to Jesus. Worship that's not located in place or location, but worship that happens when we are rooted in Christ and filled with his spirit. And then, of course, mission. And I always talk about mission up here, and I can't help it because you can't read the scriptures very long without seeing mission. It always happens. We have to do something with what, with, 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 with what God has done for us. There is a natural response. We don't do it out of guilt or obligation, but we do it because it flows out of us, naturally. Mission, and that's exactly what happened with this lady. So I want to leave you with a few questions as we stew on this. These are questions that I'm forced to ask myself when I reflect on this passage. First of all, do you believe in your self-worth? Do you believe that you are an image bearer, that you are loved, that you have value, that you have identity founded and rooted in Christ? Do you believe that about yourself? And then do you treat other people as if they have value and identity and purpose? Those are good questions to ask. ask. Secondly, are you living an abundant life? What kind of life are you living? Have you taken Jesus up on his offer for living water? For water that satisfies your soul? That, that fills the deepest longings for us that we have? Or are you finding your life in what this world has to offer? 
And then thirdly, our response and mission. Are we living a God-focused life or a self-focused life? Are we kingdom-centered or are we me-centered? What kind of life are we living? Missional living that naturally flows out of us. Are we like the Samaritan woman who responds in mission? So some things to think about as we, uh, as we feast on Turkey this afternoon. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Jesus. This Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for his life, his death, and his resurrection, but I am thankful for the way he has set an example for how I'm to live. For the things that, I want the things that matter to Jesus, I want those things to matter to me. That's, that's what I think is the best way forward. That's the, that's, that's the way we can truly experience this living water that he has given us. The things that matter to Jesus would matter to us. And so, amazing, powerful passage of scripture. We have so much to be grateful for. We have a God that places value and self-worth and identity on us, and a God who calls us and invites us to share that message with our world that so desperately needs it. As our world gets darker and darker, we ought to be lighter and lighter. Right? That's our prayer. So let me pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Jesus, we thank you that you break down all barriers to say that we have value and worth. We thank you for this incredible encounter with this woman at the well and all the things that it teaches us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the purpose you give us. We thank you for the salvation we get to experience. We thank you for living water that we get to have because of what you have done for us. Jesus, we thank you and we love you. And we want to follow you and we give our allegiance to you today. In Christ's name, amen.